Uh-huh. I heard you at the um, Drake University soil. Oh, yeah. Appreciated that a lot. Yeah. Well, some people didn't. <laughs> well, I appreciate for you ability to speak truth to mm -hmm. um, power. Well, thank you. <laughs> Okay. It's been, it's been live stream, got that. And record. Okay. <clears throat> Chris, have you heard that Neil Hamilton has a new book out? Uh, yes, I did. In fact, I reviewed one of the chapters. So. Okay. Are you? Um... I don't have the whole book yet, but uh, I did read one chapter. So I've, I've heard good things about it. Did you um, agree with the chapter? that you read? Did you like what he wrote? Um, well, the chapter I read was largely about me. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, he loved it. So he loved I, it. I, I think it was okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I think we should start. Um, I'm Terry Lohman and I'm co-chair of UUs for a Just Economic the Community. Control Center. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm also on the board for uh, Iowa UU uh, Witness Advocacy Network. Uh, tonight we've got Dr. Christopher Jones uh, to speak to us about uh, Corn Belt Water, and that should be interesting because we're we produce a lot of pollution, so they should have some things to help us with. So okay. I, I got some slides I'm going to show you here. Um, if I can find it here. Let me try. Well, we can't even that. Okay. <laughs> Which, Debbie, Debbie might want to mute. Okay. Can you see them? Mm hmm. Yes. So uh, when I was contacted here uh, a couple months ago now, I think, I think the desire for me was to speak about water quality in the context of social justice. And I've written some about that on my blog and, and spoken about it some. And so I'm trying to sprinkle a little of that into my, my usual, um, uh, presentation here tonight and so I'll show you a few slides and then if you'd like to have a discussion afterwards uh, that'd be great and so I have a, a website I keep it pretty active and so I invite you to go there and and see what I have um, I think there's a lot of opportunities to learn about Iowa water quality there I always post my slides uh, for all my presentations and so I do a lot of programs and so that's in that presentations page there. Uh, and so I already have these slides on there for tonight. So if you wanna look at them again later, you can. Um, and then I also write essays about every two weeks and I post those on the blog post page. And so I invite you to go there and, and check some of those out. And some of them aren't terrible, I don't think. But um, anyway, I talk about this nexus between water quality and, and agriculture and there's about, oh, I don't know. I think there's a couple hundred on there now. So anyway, what I do here at the University of Iowa is manage the university's uh, network of water quality sensors that are deployed around the state. And so this is one of the sites. This is actually here in Johnson County in Clear Creek. Uh, we have two uh, field technicians that work on the system. 
Uh, we have equipment deployed all over the state of Iowa. There's about 70 sites. Uh, there's a couple different funding streams for this program. Uh, the blue sites are, are what we call the IIHR sites. Those are funded through the Iowa Nutrient Research Center, which is actually at Iowa State University. That money uh, comes from the groundwater tax, um, which used to fund the Leopold Center, uh, which the legislature zeroed out. And so uh, the groundwater tax now funds uh, the Nutrient Center, it funds the Recycling uh, Center at uh, University of Northern Iowa, and then it funds the Center for Health Effects and Environmental Contaminants at the University of Iowa here. And so about $1.6 million goes to Iowa State for the Nutrient Center, about a third of that comes over to the University of Iowa, and that funds my program. And so that has purchased all the equipment at the blue sites and funds the operation of the network. The red sites have been funded through the housing and urban development uh, through what we call the Iowa Watershed Approach Project. And then we also harvest data from the USGS uh, sites. They have about 10 sites around the state of Iowa. And so we're measuring nitrate at all the sites. At a subset of sites, we're measuring these other parameters that you can see there on the left, temperature, pH, conductivity, dissolved oxygen and turbidity. And so all this data is streamed on to a website for public consumption. This is called the Iowa Water Quality Information System. This is really an excellent tool and a, a real opportunity for people to learn about Iowa water quality. And there's just really a wealth of information available there. Uh, a guy named Ibrahim Demir, a faculty here at the university, um, developed this thing and it's it's really quite something and so if you're interested in in water quality I invite you to go here you click on one of the sites and it'll give you the nitrate concentration right now right this minute and it'll delineate the upstream area from the site um, and a lot of really interesting things you can do with this and so when I talk about water quality, I commonly talk about what Iowa was like prior to Europeans getting here. And of course, um, a lot of it was wetland, about 7.6 million out of the 36 million acres was wetland. Uh, about 70% of the land area here was prairie and, and the balance was oak savanna and some forest. And of course, all this is gone now. We've uh, converted all this to crops. And so the brown area there uh, that you see in this map, that's a cropped area. The light green is pasture and the dark green is forest. Uh, the purple is urban area. And so we farm about 80% of the state of that 80%, uh, you know, all but say 10% of that is in corn and soybeans. And so we have corn and soybeans covering these two species, covering more than 70% of the state. And of course, to do all this, we had to displace the, the people that were here before us. And, um, you know, as we talk about these water and environmental issues in social justice, we, in social justice, we'd be remiss to not talk about how we displace the native people that were here. And so, um, the Native American people that were here um, were largely displaced through nine treaties um, that were signed between 1824 and, and 1853 that moved uh, the natives around the state and eventually out of the state. And so the primary groups that were here were the Sac and the Fox, but also the Winnebago's, the Sioux and the Potawatomi's, and they were forced to sell all their land at an average of about eight cents per acre. Uh, in the 1850s, some of the displaced Meskwakis um, began returning to Iowa and were able to purchase uh, land at their present settlement near Tama. And this had to be approved by the Iowa legislature. Uh, Native Americans weren't allowed to own land at that time. And so the Iowa legislature allowed this purchase to go through. Uh, the land they sold for eight cents per acre, they had to buy it back at 12.50 per acre. And so they, um, 
initially bought 80 acres and now they're they're up to about 8,000 acres there in Tama over there um, between Marshalltown and Cedar Rapids. And so if you don't know this, this little triangle of Iowa that is down in the far southeast corner, that was part of these tr treaties. And um, this was um, um, the half, what they called the half breed track. And so uh, these, this piece of land, that little piece of land in the far southeast corner was uh, reserved for um, the descendants of white men that had married with uh, Native American women. And so they were able to live there for 10 years, but eventually the whites decided they wanted that too, and they booted them out in 1834. And so Iowa farming here, I mean, it is predominantly white. I think we all know this. Uh, 2017, we had roughly 86,000 uh, farmers here in Iowa, what USDA calls primary producers. 86,104, 85,827 of them were white or 99.6%. Very, very few um, uh, people of color farming in Iowa. And, you know, compared to Iowa as a whole, well, Iowa is, you know, um, we don't have a, a large percentage of people of color, but certainly we have more than what's representative in the farming population. And so this did not happen by chance. Um, this uh, happened very deliberately and happened through policy decisions. And so in the territorial laws of Iowa, uh, 1839, 1838, 1839, you know, the legislature here, um, as it states there, um, that no black or mulatto person shall be permitted to settle or reside in this territory unless they can produce a certificate from a court. And if they could produce the certificate, then they had to pay a $500 bond to come into the state. And so $500, you know, at this time in the 1830s was an enormous amount of money for people that, you know, really had nothing. And so if black people were allowed into the state, they weren't allowed to purchase land or it was made very difficult for them. And so as a consequence, you know, all our farmland is owned by white people. And so this has continued to this day and again figures into this discussion of water quality and social justice here in Iowa. And so prior to European settlement, what, what did our streams look like here? Well, we know the prairie streams were these wide, shallow streams that meandered across the landscape and they spilled out into their floodplain very frequently. We had perennial plants on the stream bank that provided a lot of surface area to um, disperse the energy of falling rain down falling raindrops. The substrate of the stream was sand or gravel. We had gently yeah. sloping banks and the water table was very close to the, the surface. And so then we got here and we started plowing and you know John Deere invented the first uh, steel plow and we broke the prairie with that and we had an enormous amount of erosion here in the first decades uh, after we started farming. And this is especially evident in certain parts of Iowa, but Northeast Iowa is one where we had just this biblical amount of erosion uh, that occurred after Europeans got here and started farming. And so the driftless area up here, which is uh, pretty hilly, um, an enormous amount of erosion in, in Iowa and especially in Wisconsin um, after we started farming this. The other thing we did, another thing we did is we started draining. And so much of Iowa, especially North Central Iowa is very wet. And so we needed to lower the water table to optimize conditions for the production of corn and soybeans. And so we created these trapezoidal ditches with steam shovels we see in the upper left. Uh, we put in the field tile. And so if you don't know these uh, clay pipes were put down about four feet 
with a gap between each pipe and then they backfilled with gravel, rock, and that allowed the water table to descend down about four feet. And so now in the present day, this is what things look like. We've lowered the water table, the field tiles are coming out into these ditches and some of these ditches are huge. And so the field tiles feed into these county drainage networks. And um, as they proceed down towards the ditch, the pipes get ever larger. And so we see a big, um, County tile main here. This is North Ames a little bit. And yeah, there's somebody standing in that pipe. And so we've radically altered the hydrology of the landscape by lowering the water table. And so prior to settlement, you know, the Des Moines lobe area, this is that area running from Des Moines to the Minnesota border, you know, would it look like this uh, with all these prairie pothole wetlands? And of course, we drained all that. And so we, um, you know, destroyed a lot of habitat, basically um, extirpated an entire wetland ecosystem that was here. And we continue to tile now, um, you know, we don't do the old clay pipes, we do the black plastic corrugated pipe um, that's perforated and, um, you know, farmers are really, uh, as, as the climate is getting wetter, they're wanting more and more of this tile they can tile a lot of acres with this equipment. And, and so you see it going in all over Iowa still and it costs about a thousand dollars an acre to tile land like this, but the banks will loan farmers money to do it. And so we continue to do it. And so as a result of these hydrological modifications, this is how many of our streams start. And so the Iowa River that flows through Iowa City here, this is the start of the Iowa River in north, north central Iowa, where all these field tiles uh, uh, spill into this trapezoidal ditch. And so we look across Iowa and this drop here from the tile to the ditch on average is about three feet. And so we think prior to settlement, there was probably a wetland up here in the background that gently spilled into a stream channel. Now we've immediately added three foot ahead to the water entering our streams. And so from the very beginning, our streams are energized because of the changes in hydrology. And so this is important in terms of water quality and how our streams look. The other thing we did is we straightened our streams. And so this is Walnut Creek in Jasper County. Uh, the green is the meandering prairie stream in 1930. The red is the stream now. And so we straightened these streams to square them up so we could farm uh, the ground more efficiently. We used the spoils to levy the streams and divorce the stream from the floodplain. At the same time, the vertical drop from point A to point B is the same, but we've decreased the stream length by half. And so what we've done is we've energized this water. And so the vertical drop is the same, but the, the horizontal distance is halved. And so that means that water has way more energy. As a consequence, these streams erode downward. And so we see most of our streams here in Iowa are in this stage four of, of degradation uh, where the banks are, the, it's eroded downward and the banks are sloughing off into the stream. And so this is Walnut Creek and um, these two photos are taken from the same vantage point. So you can see this hill slope in the background here. And so about the first six feet of this material in the river bottom has all been deposited since settlement. And so this is all eroded material from the uplands. The streams are so flashy now because we don't have perennial cover on the river, on the river bank. And so this stream can go from the top picture to the bottom picture and back to the top picture in 24 hours. Amazing. And because this material has been recently deposited in the last 150 years or so, it's really vulnerable to sloughing. And so you can see it sloughing off into the stream. And so consequently, our streams are always muddy. So we can get even the most uh, mild rainstorm and our streams muddy up and it's because of this phenomenon. 
because the streams are so flashy, uh, vegetation can't get established on the stream bank to prevent this sloughing. And so we have this flashy hydrological condition. And so, um, you know, no native species evolved, you know, to endure this uh, sort of hydrological condition. And so now our streams are all down in these canyons. And so when you drive across the countryside and you see those streams way down there in these canyons, if you didn't know any better, you'd think that's the way they're supposed to look. It's not, they all eroded downward. We have the tile coming in now. We have pollution tolerant species that dominate the streams like carp and, and bullhead and some generalist species still remain the channel catfish. On the stream banks, we have the annual plants that are providing the surface area to uh, disperse the energy of the falling raindrops only about four months out of the year. And the water table is much deeper. And so we've radically changed the hydrology of Iowa and this has had consequences for water quality. And so we have thousands of miles of streams where we've straightened them. And so the South Skunk River, Southeast of Ames, uh, that's one. And so you see this stream, it doesn't have any meanders and so, you know, what desirable species have evolved to live in this condition? There aren't any. While we were doing all this, we uh, took diversified farms and we specialized them. And so this is a really famous map from a farm in Winnebago County in 1941. We have a large diversity of land uses here. Oats, corn, uh, hay, and, and so on. Um, we fast forward to 1976, and now that farm is all corn and soybeans, a few oats. Uh, those would be gone in the present day, a little bit of hay, that'd be gone too. And so, you know, now all our farms look like this. And so we have the nice clean fields, right, with the corn and soybean. Um, we have hogs, we have 25 million hogs in Iowa. You could drive clear across Iowa and never see one hog because they're all you know, in these buildings on the hillside. And then we have the ethanol industry. And so when you drive by and you see these farms, they look so, uh, you know, they're suburban type clean and it's hard to imagine that there's any pollution coming from them. Uh, but the truth of the matter is there, there, there is, and I think we all know that. And so in addition to that, we have you know, 8,000 or thereabouts CAFOs in Iowa now. Uh, this map shows the, just the swine operations, um, and you can see they're concentrated in, in northwest Iowa here, uh, especially, but uh, here along the uh, ridge between the Mississippi and Missouri uh, divide, and then north central Iowa, and then down here in Washington County. And so we have one out of every three hogs in the United States. We have uh, 25 million here at any one time. And about 50 million come to slaughter every year. And so dealing with the waste from this, you know, it's a challenge. Let's face it, it's a big challenge and it's had consequences for our water quality. And so the things we talk about most here these days are still the erosion um, that's uh, causing our streams and lakes to be muddy. And then the nutrient pollution, which of course is um, impairing our lakes with these algae and then causing drinking water issues. Uh, we've improved on soil erosion, but our soil loss is still very high, especially uh, in areas going to the Missouri River here in western Iowa and then up here in northeast Iowa. <clears throat> and we talk about nutrient pollution a lot, especially nitrate pollution. Uh, nitrogen, uh, we apply for corn, of course, as anhydrous ammonia, urea, urea ammonium nitrate, manure, and then the mono and diammonium phosphate. Um, the ammonia is converted in the soil to nitrate uh, by a process mediated by bacteria. Farmers apply about 40% in the fall and 60% in the spring, but uh, there was a lot of fall applied last year because um, farmers were really concerned about the price going up and the availability being difficult in the spring, and that has been borne out. And so fall applied nitrogen is much more vulnerable to loss than that applied in the spring. And so 
as we talk about nitrogen, um, one thing we don't like to talk about anymore is what we call a mass balance issue. And so the wide bars, the wide bars here are the inputs. And so we have commercial nitrogen, hog manure nitrogen, beef, dairy, fixation from soybeans, poultry, and so forth. Those are the wide bars. The narrow bar, the narrow yellow bar, is the amount of nitrogen that's being harvested in the crop. And so we can see the inputs you know, are sub substantially larger than what's being removed in the crop. And so that surplus, that's the red line here, uh, that surplus, it doesn't just go off into the Milky Way, it's gonna go somewhere and about 32% of it makes it into our streams. And so we have this mass balance issue where the inputs exceed the outputs. And why is that? It's because when we over apply nutrients, the taxpayer shoulders the burden for the environmental consequences. And so when a farmer applies too much nutrient, you know, he's not held accountable for the pollution that results from that. And so consequently, we apply nutrient as insurance, um, you know, guarding against loss that might occur from rainstorms. And so, as I said, this doesn't just go into the Milky Way, it goes into our streams and lakes, but it also goes into the groundwater. We've had about 7,000 private wells in Iowa that have tested above the drinking water limit for nitrate since the year 2000. About one third of our public water supplies, we have about, I believe, 900 uh, public water supplies in Iowa. About one third of them have been deemed vulnerable to nitrate con contamination. We have 60 uh, public water supplies. They're actually removing nitrate uh, to keep the water safe. And about 25% of all Iowans drink water that has been treated for nitrate reduction. And so these are the 60 where some sort of nitrate treatment is necessary. And so some of these systems are consecutive to Des Moines. And of course, Des Moines is is removing uh, nitrate. And so like West Des Moines and Ankeny and Urbandale, they're all buying water from Des Moines. So they're on this list. But we also see small towns here, um, you know, Hospers, for example, population 706, uh, Granville, Iowa, population 317, or even like Boone, um, which is on here, 12,934. I mean, this is a, you know, for Des Moines, where you can disperse the cost of nitrate removal over a large population, you know, these smaller towns, you know, you can't. It's a burden for small towns when they have their water supply contaminated with, with nitrate. And so, again, this is when we talk about equity and social justice, you know, we have these drinking water issues. And so Toledo, Ohio lost their supply. Oh, I think about eight years ago because of a big algae bloom in Lake Erie that's driven by a nutrient pollution. And then, of course, Des Moines has the largest nitrate removal facility in the world there at their treatment plant on Fleur Drive. And so Toledo, we see down here at the very western edge of Lake Erie in this area of um, northwest Ohio, northeast Indiana and southern Michigan. Uh, intense farming here, much like Iowa, um, especially the Maumee River, which flows right into Lake Erie at Toledo, carries a large load of nutrients and causes these big algae blooms in Lake Erie, and it caused Toledo to lose their supply. Uh, likewise, Des Moines is at the bottom of these two big watersheds of Des Moines and Raccoon Rivers, uh, intensely farmed, uh, probably 80% at least corn and soybeans. Um, a lot of livestock, a lot of uh, hogs, especially, but also uh, chickens. Um, a lot of the laying chickens are in the Des Moines River watershed. And so we have this city here at the bottom that has to cope with this pollution. But one we don't talk about much is Ottumwa, and Ottumwa uses the Des Moines River. And uh, they have an issue with nitrate. And Ottumwa is, uh, you know, a poor community. It ranks about in the mid 700s out of about 900 communities in median household income. 
Uh, it's in Wapalo County, which is one of the poorest counties in the state. Uh, their water treatment plant was built during the depression um, and it's in need of repair and uh, or replacement. And so this is a city that has to cope with this upstream pollution, right, from, you know, wealthy landowners uh, that really doesn't have the resources to do that. And so, as I've said uh, previously here, these water quality issues here, they are justice issues. They are social justice issues for many people in Iowa. And so not only our drinking water, but our our surface water gets contaminated. And so, as I said, Lake Erie here, uh, we see many um, lakes in Iowa where the beaches have to close in the summertime because of these algae blooms. And then we have the dead zone down in the Gulf of Mexico where these nutrients you know, ultimately end up in the Mississippi River. They go out into the Gulf and they catalyze these big algae blooms and as the algae die, they consume oxygen and they leave the coastal areas unsuitable for the fish and the, sh and the shrimp and the crabs. And so we get a dead zone form down here off the coast of Louisiana every year. So what are we doing about this? Well, in Iowa, we have the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy. That's our main policy in instrument. It was developed by Iowa State University, uh, Iowa Department of Agriculture, and Iowa DNR. And what it does is it, uh, identif it identified the practices that farmers could use to reduce nutrient loss from their fields to the stream network. And so some of those practices include cover crops. And so these are plants that go unharvested, uh, plant the seeds in the fall, they grow a little bit in the fall, they overwinter, they grow some more in the early spring and they sequester water and nitrogen. Then the farmer will kill these, uh, usually with Roundup, but also they'll roll them down before planting their cash crop in the spring. Uh, that's one practice farmers can get a cost share for. Also, we have these edge of field treatments like the constructed wetlands. We have about a hundred of these in Iowa. We need thousands. And then we have these things uh, called saturated buffers where the tile line will um, get intercepted by a header and the water from the header is dispersed over a, a stream length of maybe a thousand feet. And then the trees and the other plants in the riparian um, area of the stream will uh, process the water and the nitrate and keep it from getting into the stream. But what's the economics of removing this from the, from the tile water? Well, to buy nitrogen today, it costs about $1.20 a pound. And I mean, this is at record high prices right here, $1.20 a pound. But to remove it using the practices that are outlined in the nutrient strategy costs between two and $10 a pound, depending on what you do. You know, so how is this gonna work? You can buy it for $1.20, but it takes up to $10 to, to clean it, uh, clean the water so we get our water quality objectives. And so our average statewide nitrate load in our streams is about 600 million pounds of nitrogen per year. Our goal for the nutrient strategy is a 45% reduction, which would be 270 million pounds a year. And so you know, just using what we know uh, for the cost to remove nitrogen, you know, this would be between 540 million and 2.7 billion a year. And so, you know, the entire budget for the state of Iowa is about $30 billion. And so who's going to pay for this? You know, that's um, the real justice component here is who is going to pay for this pollution. And right now the taxpayer largely pays. Uh, but still, we're not anywhere close to meeting our, our objectives. At the same time we're doing this, uh, we keep putting in tile. And so we had this tile mapping project and this Jaron Glosser guy, he was an undergraduate that worked with me. Um, he was a wrestler on the University of Iowa team. He did a tile mapping project for us, looking at several watersheds using aerial imagery like you see here. 
And he looked at these watersheds here, the Middle Cedar, Upper Wapsie, and so forth. Uh, and so we can see here the money that farmers are spending on new tile every year. And so tile is the primary delivery mechanism for nitrate from the farm fields to the stream network. And when we use his data, we look at statewide, you know, farmers are spending over $70 million a year on new tile. So this dwarfs the amount that we're spending on practices, uh, you know, to intercept the nitrate, you know. So again, how is this going to work as we keep throwing tile into the ground, you know, unabated and unregulated? At the same time, we subsidize all this through our tax dollars. Iowa farmers have received about $36 billion since 1995 in the various subsidies. Uh, you know, and, and these farmers, by and large, um, you know, are well above the average income level here uh, in Iowa, and uh, their value of their wealth can be quite large in terms of their land and their, their other assets. And so again, this is, um, you know, feeds into this idea of, you know, what's just here in terms of the farming and the pollution and the drinking water and so forth. And so here are some graphs. Um, these are the, the counties, the, farm, the largest farm subsidies per person, uh, the top 10 counties. You can see them here, Pocahontas County is number one, over $80,000 um, per person since 1995. And so, you know, when you, when you uh, divide that out over the last 25 years, you know, that's more than $3,000 per person per year that's coming into this county, just in farm subsidies. Um, these are the, the bottom 10 here. We see uh, Polk County, of course, the most populous county, uh, you know, less than $1,000 per person over 25 years. Uh, in terms of crop acre, we see the Southern Iowa counties have by far the, um, largest subsidies uh, per crop acre. This is marginal land in Southern Iowa, really hilly. Uh, a lot of the soils are not great. Um, and so all these counties here, you can see yourself uh, uh, Highway 34. Uh, the bottom 10 in a per crop acre basis, some of our most productive counties, like Sac County, for example, uh, Kasuth County, where the subsidy per, per acre is far less. And so how do we overcome the structural drivers to bad qual water quality? The, the structural drivers is we only have two plant species on the landscape. There's no diversity on the landscape. And we have all these animals, uh, 25 million hogs, 80 million chickens, 4 million beef cattle, 220,000 dairy cattle, you know, how do we get water quality in this scenario? And so there's a guy at Iowa State recently retired, Matt Liebman, spent his career uh, researching these extended rotations, uh, the five-year rotation here of corn, soybean, oats, and then two years of alfalfa versus a two-year rotation of corn and soybean. Uh, fertilizer use 91% lower in the five-year rotation. Herbicide use, 97% lower. The weed biomass was similar. Um, reduced disease for soybeans. The soil health is better. Tile nitrate down almost 60%. Cut erosion in half. Fossil fuel use is less, uh, less than half. And the net returns for the farmer were similar, right? He's making similar money. Um, and so why don't we do this? And so the answer is, is to grow corn and soybeans really only takes about six to eight weeks out of the year of labor. To do this is like a nine or 10 month a year job. And so consequently, um, you know, we've created a system where farmers can work, you know, not very many hours and still make decent incomes growing corn and soybeans. Now, of course, if they have animals, uh, it's a different story, but 
we only have about 10% of our farms now that have livestock. And so all this is happening within the context of climate change. You know, all this stuff that we're doing, you know, we're trying to fix it, but we're not doing it in a um, scenario where it's stable. And so we, what we say in the business is we don't have stationarity. Things are changing. And so when I look at the Raccoon River watershed, for example, and I divide the precipitation record into two 50-year halves. So what you're looking at here is 1920 to 1969 and 19. Uh, 70 to 2019. And when I look at that, annual precipitation exceeded one meter exactly one time in the first 50 years. Okay, so more than one meter of rainfall in the Raccoon River watershed from 1920 to 1969. From 1970 to 2019, it exceeded one meter 15 times. Okay, 15 times. Uh, conversely, drought uh, less than 600 millimeters nine times in the first 50 years, less than 600 millimeters, only two times in the last 50 years, and none since 1980. And so it's getting wetter. And so as we try to fix these water quality issues, we have to cope with the fact that it's getting wetter, and farmers are going to respond to that by putting in more tile. And so the question we have for our state is what do we want this agricultural production system to look like? Right now we have a system designed for commerce. We have two species out there. We have about 60% of the corn going to make ethanol, the rest going to livestock feed, and we have soybeans that are going largely to livestock feed. And so do we want a system that's de designed for commerce or do we want a system that's designed for nutrition, equity, and good environmental outcomes? And so I would say most Iowan, Iowans would pick the second thing, but you know, there's very powerful interests that maintain this uh, status quo where we have a system designed for commerce. And so I like to finish with this map uh, what I did was I looked at all the, what we call Huck 8 watersheds in Iowa. There's 56 of them. Um, they're about a thousand square miles e each. I looked at the livestock populations in each watershed and determined how much fecal waste they were excreting and what the human equivalent of that fecal waste was. And so these are the effective fecal populations that we have living in our watersheds. And so when we add in our livestock, we've got the equivalent of about 168 million people living here in Iowa. And we're trying to deal with that waste and dispose of it and not pollute our water. And so I would ask, you know, <clears throat> is this situation, can we reconcile that with our water quality objectives? And I would say that we cannot. And so, we have a problem of scale here uh, that we really need to talk about, but the political and economic establishment here is really reluctant to talk about this because they want to continue to expand the system. And so that's my last slide. I will be happy to um, answer some questions here. I see there's one already in the chat and I'll go ahead and answer that. Um, can the cover crops be something harvestable rather than killing them off with Roundup or equivalent? And the answer to that is yes, um, but there's rules about cost share. And so when we pay farmers for cover crops, historically, we have not wanted them to use them as livestock feed or to graze them or to bale it or whatnot, because then they begin, then they profit off of it. And so if we have um, cost share for that, you know, there's been rules that, against that. And so um, they've tried to devise some things uh, like reduce crop insurance rates and these sorts of things if farmers plant cover crops. But the overall answer is no, those things go unharvested. 
So isn't that a good thing? Um, so I'm not sure what the question. No, wouldn't the farmer profiting off the cover crop be a good thing? That's right. Positive, right? In the real world. So you can take, I, you know, you can have that position, but if you're paying for the cover crops, you know, it's like, you know, we're, we're paying them to not pollute by giving them the money for the cover crops, then they're using the cover crops to earn revenue. And so there's people that see a perversity in that. Well, if somebody was making $100 an acre or $1,000 an acre from selling the cover crop, wouldn't we have to bribe them $1,000 less to put in the cover crop? Um, so, <laughs> you know, th th there's, a, there's, been a, there's <laughs> been a lot of discussion. There's been a lot of discussion about and the, the USDA, the general rules about, you know, that USDA uses is that if we're, if the taxpayer is paying for it, that, you know, the farmer shouldn't be able to sell it or graze it. And, you know, this is just something that goes back decades. And like I said, I mean, you can, you can try, try to rationalize one thing or another in your mind, but, you know, let's say oats, we use oats for a cover crop sometimes it's not the most common one but it, it can well if you buy the farmer the seeds and he plants them and he harvests them and sells them you know to whoever you know some people as i said see a perversity in that what about plowing under is that bad plowing the cover crop under yes sir um it's so that's plowing under is what we consider, you know, mold board plow or, you know, conventional um, tillage. And uh, we largely see that is not environmentally sound in the present day. But, you know, like organic farmers, they do a lot of plowing. You know, they have to because they don't use chemicals. And so the weed pressures in organic systems are, you know, intense. And so they do a lot of plowing. And so they'll plow under stuff as you describe. And so with all these things, there are trade-offs, right? And so you might do a lot of plowing and use less chemical, but you have more soil, soil erosion. And so everything we do out there, there's trade-offs. And... So you can't say just, um, you know, for that, that, you know, make a blanket statement, it's, it's bad. We, we could make some policy decisions about that. I mean, there are some things that we do think are just flat out bad, period, like putting manure on snow. But, um, you know, it depends, uh, I guess, is my answer. Lucy. Okay, we have two people with their hands up. Uh, I guess we'll ask Deb to unmute. There you go. Good. So, uh, <clears throat> Chris, I wonder if anybody has estimated how long the, with the way the land is farmed, it will last and be continue to be productive. Is is um, whether that's from erosion or other things that happen. It seems like most uh, <clears throat> who own farmland want to give it to their kids and their grandkids, and it's an asset that they don't want to lose. But if it can't be farmed in the future, that might be a motivation that makes a difference. So the answer is it depends where it's at. And so you saw those graphs where I showed the counties that are getting the most subsidies per crop acre all down there south of Highway 34. <clears throat> you know, and that stuff's about gone now. Yeah. Um, you know, it's highly eroded. It's, um, you know, a lot of it's farmed out. We have a lot of CRP down in that part of the state. And so the margin for error there is very small. I would also say that's the case in northeast, far northeast Iowa. 
say everything um, north and east of um, Strawberry Point, if you know where that's at, Elkator. Um, now the Des Moines Lobe, which again is where the glacier was 10,000 years ago, you know, I-35 runs through the middle of it. Northwest Iowa, um, you know, Lyon County, Sioux County, uh, and then a lot of the stuff kind of north of Cedar Rapids, between Cedar Rapids and Charles City, um, there's a lot of topsoil still left. And so, you know, if you ever see a backhoe, you know, dig into the earth there around Fort Dodge, uh, you know, there's a lot of topsoil there, you know, six feet probably or more. And so it just depends on where you're at uh, is the answer. But in some areas, um, you know, we are very, very vulnerable. Is there any chance with uh, climate change, especially, um, that there would be changes one in the subsidies going towards small farmers, for example, instead of these huge monocrop places and moving towards localization uh, subsistence in a sense for the people of Iowa instead of the kind of economy you've got now, given that you know things are going to change now. <laughs> You're not gonna be wanting to truck so much. You maybe will not go for much livestock, I mean, that might diminish. Is there any movement in Iowa towards a whole different system of agriculture? Well, the short answer to that is no. The, <laughs> the uh, you know, everything they do, I mean, everything these guys do from the moment their feet hit the floor in the morning to the moment their head hits the pillow, at night is uh, connected to the federal farm bill. And so everything they do, literally. And yeah. so change has got to happen there. It, you know, you've got massive continental scale problems here. And so to think we can solve this through individual actions is a fantasy in my opinion. And so you need a policy and leadership at the highest levels to affect change. And so, you know, the one thing that has got to go away uh, if we're going to change this system is ethanol. You know, we oh, know yeah. that ethanol, we have 60% of our corn going to ethanol, and it's so easy for farmers to just, you know, grow corn for ethanol on a lot of acres, it's easy. And, you know, again, like I said, it's six or eight weeks a year with all the technology now, with the um, global positioning uh, stuff on the equipment and, you know, the big uh, equipment, the big 48 row, 54 row planters. Um, I mean, these guys can farm till they're 85 years old. You know, they keep six going weeks. and, <laughs> And so consequently, they farm, you know, six, eight weeks out of the year and then go to Florida or Scottsdale. And so young guys cannot get into farming. This system has inflated land values. And so now, you know, our land costs $15,000 an acre and more. And so it's impossible for young people to break in that might be more inclined to do different things and grow different crops. And so we have a lot of um, obstacles here to change. Now, you know, if ethanol would go away, that would open up a lot of acres, a lot of acres. And land prices would, would very likely de decline. But if that's the case, we'd need to have policy to keep the rich people, rich guys from swooping in and buying all that land, yeah. which would definitely would happen. And so we need um, policy to address these issues, uh, the demographics of farming where, you know, the average age of the farmer, Iowa farmer now is 60 um, and the land prices 
And then the fact that, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to do it here in Iowa these days. Well, 2023 is the farm bill, anything to be done on that. <laughs> so the, you know, um, what was I going to say? Um, oh, doggone it. The, I can't remember, but, um, you know, the G GMO, a lot of people, they, they don't like the idea of GMO and they think about it from the human health perspective, but you know, my um, opinion is there's much bigger fish to pro bigger fish to fry. The issue with GMO that people don't understand is it's allowed, it's made corn and soybean farming so easy. Yeah. And so it's allowed them to farm lots and lots of acres. And so that's had, you know, economic consequences, it's had sociological consequences, and it's had environmental consequences. But a lot of people want to talk about GMO like it's poison. Well, no, that's, that's not the issue with GMO. The issue with GMO is it has enabled all these other things to happen um, and to grow you know, corn and soybeans on a lot of acres with not that much time. You're muted, Terry. Question. J Jane oh. has her hand up. Oh, okay. Uh, I just have, um, I wanna get into like talking about the sociology of this more like, um, I'm gonna, well, I'm trying to put my hand down, but anyway. First of all, why are farmer suicides so high right now is part of my question. But the other part of my question, we talk about the farmer, the farmer, the farmer, but how many farmers actually own the land and they're farming land for someone else? I mean, there's, we gotta get, we just use this generic word farmer, but it's more complicated than that. Because if you're farming for somebody else and you have a, um, if you're not renting land and you have crop share, I mean, how much decision making part, decision making part and power does the farmer have in Iowa? And so to the first question, I, I'd say, you know, that's not, I'm not an authority on the sociological stuff or the mental health stuff. Although I do think suicide has always been, um, you know, much higher in farmers in general population. Uh, the second question, the rented land is a huge issue in Iowa. And so I think over 50% of our farmland is rented. And so, you know, firstly ask yourself who owns that land? And so a lot of it is the heirs of, of farmers that you know, the farmer died uh, and the wife is renting it or they're both passed away and the kids have the land and they're renting it. Quite often, you know, if there's multiple kids, only one of them wants to farm, but all the kids own some of the land. And so one of them is renting from the siblings. And so we have these sorts of situations of, of rental, right? Um, and so much of it is, are the heirs of earlier farmers. And so some of them might live in Kansas City or Minneapolis or Chicago or Des Moines, what have you. And so this is a huge issue. Yes, on conservation, what farmer is gonna use his own money to pay for conservation on land he doesn't own? That's unreasonable. I think most people agree with that. But, you know, these people that own the land, uh, you know, they're capitalists. They want a return on their capital. And so they're not going to voluntarily spend money on that capital unless they have to. And so we don't have any laws that force them to do that. In my estimation, what we need to do is to make this uh, situ situation unfavorable for people to own this land. And so the land is, is so, so inflated right now. 
you know, it's over $15,000 an acre, as I said. And why is that? Well, it's largely because of the renewable fuel stand. Well, if we regulated the environmental outcomes from uh, this rented land, and if you know, we made it uh, unfavorable in other ways for people to own this, that would have multiple benefits for us as a state. Uh, firstly, we would give the opportunity for young farmers to get into farming uh, because the land prices would go down. Uh, we, we would get the environmental outcomes that we want, or we would get better environmental outcomes if we regulated the pollution from this uh, rented land. And so, for example, let's just say we required uh, cover crops on all uh, rented land. Let's say we did that. It's $30 per acre. I mean, immediately the rents would drop. Immediately, overnight the rents would drop. And when the rents drop, the value of the land drops. When the value of the land drops, then that enables you to do other things with that land. Either, you know, transferring ownership to someone, you know, that once they bought it, they would be good stewards of it. Uh, or they might want to do something other than corn and soybeans. And so I think regulating the environmental outcomes on this rented land would produce a lot of economic and sociological benefits for us as a state. And so I agree, I have no sympathy for somebody sitting in Minneapolis that owns farmland down here and it's renting it for $350 an acre. And, you know, they don't want to do any conservation at all. It's a problem. Yeah, it's, it's more complicated problem. than that because what you have is a bunch of siblings. Like yeah, I'm a well, prime example. That. I'm an example of this, and I want to do things on our farmland on both sides of my family. We have farms, and I want to try all this stuff, but I got uh, it's just like I can't get anywhere because I'm twelve point so, five. Right, and that's why interest. we need laws. That's why we need laws, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Okay, There's going to be I, disagreements for sure. So I want to speak to this issue as well, because I inherited, like you said, I inherited some land from my dad and we rent it now. Um, we, I, I hardly know where to start. We do a flex lease. So we work with our renter because we know that he's, he's struggling sometimes. He only has 600 acres to farm. He's not one of the 3000 acre ones. He's has, he's had to, um, background cattle so he can make enough money so it's it's complicated like jane said my brother and i have had many conversations with our renter we would love for him to do cover crops he's farmers like any other professional don't like to change what they've been doing and some will and some won't and so it, like jane said it's it's very it's not as easy as it sounds and it's and i and i agree that that the owners should be the stewards. We sh we have offered to pay for cover crops. We are working with our renter to get him to see the value of that, or some other sort. If it's not a cover crop, then more buffer strips along the waterway, um, maybe some prairie strips. So we we take this very seriously that we are the owners and we are the primary stewards of this land. But it's as Jane said, it is complicated, and every as my brother would say, every farm is different in this state. But I do you I, another another um, presentation you did for the 100 grannies that there are farmers who will do two or 3,000 acres and they they rent it out and they can that's all they do when you got we if you can afford the big machinery you can do th several <clears throat> thousands of corn or beans and it's they can do it but the smaller farmers it's a it's more of a struggle yeah well I I a couple things here uh, I know it's complicated I comment as well when you get done okay. Well, I know it's complicated. I, I understand that. But this goes to my comment that we have continental scale problems here. Mm -hmm. And there no problem of that scale, to my knowledge, has ever been solved through individual actions. So I, and so yeah. what you're describing here is you're trying to solve something that's gigantic through individual actions, and it's not going to happen. No. You need try to policy. take personal responsibility. It's very difficult to take personal responsibility. Yeah, I um, mean, 
Sure. When the when the dollar sign is the you know the bottom line at the end of the day, yeah. I mean, it, we're all human beings, right? <laughs> we're all gonna gonna make choices. Um, let me let me speak to so, the personal responsibility and Jane's question about suicide because I'm a psychiatrist. Okay, and and then this particular renter, who's a who's a fine man, he's got a, a great family. And, and in frustration when talking about cover crops or any change, this man is working his butt off. He has no retirement, mm -hmm. you know. I worked at the university, I got a great retirement plan. Okay. Um, how do you, and he's raising cattle and trying to make ends meet. And so from the perspective of a landowner, uh, putting more pressure on such a man, mm -hmm. that's not a good thing. And, and so uh, I think our personal responsibility is to be sensitive to that and to work on the bigger solutions that you're talking about, Chris. And I, and I appreciate the, that personal responsibility argument isn't gonna do it. And I have a serious question for you, given our political climate, and the message that you're sending are are you threatened um, well i had uh, i had one legislature legislator who was a farmer um send some emails to people my superiors suggesting that i shouldn't work here anymore uh but um you know i uh people ask me this a lot and it's probably you know the pushback's probably less than what you you'd expect and the reason for that in my estimation is is the system is so entrenched that a guy like me is no threat to him okay and <laughs> um you know i'm just a fly on an elephant's ass and so um so not too much but you know, on this whole thing, this whole issue of, you know, how do we get the environmental outcomes that we want? So that is a question. And so we, what we need to do is describe those quantitatively, okay? We want our water quality, we want our nitrate to be X and phosphorus to be Y and the clarity of the water to be Z. We define that quantitatively and we start pri prioritizing them. And then we work backwards to get those objectives. And so the science on this is not mysterious. The problem is the industry will not even let us have those objectives. Okay, we cannot even have, we, the farm, the agriculture will not even let us have stream standards for nutrients. And so we cannot even take that first baby step. And so, yes, I who does not uh, have compassion for a human being that's working very hard and does not have a lot of money and is frustrated and depressed and all these other things? I mean, who doesn't have compassion for that person? But I will say, you know, I'm 61 years old. The water here, and I've lived most of my life here, the water has been polluted here for my, my entire life. Okay. <laughs> my entire life. And I'm saying that's wrong. And that is a bigger issue. That is a bigger thing than a guy that is, you know, unhappy with his career. And, you know, that's how I would state that. And so, you know, we have a metropolitan area <laughs> of over a half a million people that has impaired water like no other place on earth in terms of nutrients. And so I understand that, yes, we have these sociological things and these, these individual stories that can be heart-wrenching. But the truth of the matter is, we have an environmental disaster here 
that is what we need to talk about. And the idea that all these farms are different, I know, you know, people in agriculture say that all the time. And my response to that is these farms could not be more similar. They all, they're all growing the same two species. They're all growing GMO corn. They're all planting at the same time. They're all spraying at the same time. They're all harvesting at the same time. The market is the same for all of them. They could not be more similar. And so to me, as an argument against regulation, it doesn't hold water. And so, yeah, I know some areas of Iowa are hilly and some are flat and some are colder and warmer and so forth. But, you know, we do not have diversity on farms. We just don't. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I think that's a crazy notion. I, I have a Chris, question. Yeah, go ahead. I, you've been modeling patience here. I've been waiting. <laughs> um, so I was wondering if you could talk about um, how water quality might be affected by the carbon sequestered pipelines that are proposed? Uh, yeah, and so so the, the pipeline is a plain and simple, it's a lifeboat for ethanol. And so they see, they, they are nervous about ethanol. The emergence of the electric cars, they're not blind. They, they see that it's a threat. And the demand for liquid fuels was already declining. And so we saw that during COVID, we saw the decline for liquid fuel in the United States dec uh, decline. And that's because, you know, cars are getting better mileage and we're driving less miles. Young people nowadays, they don't even want cars, right? Go to Portland or any of these West Coast cities, they don't even have cars. And so, you know, the decline for liquid, the, the demand for liquid fuel is going to decline. And the way the renewable fuel standard is structured, the growth for ethanol, there is not going to be any. And so they're nervous. And with the emergence of cars, they need to do something. And so the carbon pipeline, what it does is it perhaps, perhaps gives them a shot at having EPA declaring ethanol as what they consider an advanced biofuel. And that means it the carbon emissions are half of gasoline. Now that's been called into question because of this new paper from these guys at the University of Wisconsin showing that ethanol actually, you know, increases greenhouse gas emissions over gasoline. But if they can get that designation as an advanced biofuel for ethanol, that opens up the California market for ethanol. And so that is the gamble that they're making. And so if they can get that, they are going to entrench all these corn acres, you know, probably for the next 30 years. And so that is the, what's going on here with the carbon pipeline is it's not so much the ethanol, they got to keep those acres in corn. So it costs an eight hundred. It costs about eight hundred dollars to plant an acre of corn these days when you count the land and the labor. But you know the seed and the fertilizer and the machinery and all these other inputs. I mean, it's gigantic, and they are scared that they're going to lose all that. And so that's why, you know, we don't go to other crops. Corn is a high input crop, right? It costs a lot of takes a lot of buying of stuff to plant corn. And that's why agribusiness does not want to lose these corn acres. Sure, we could grow apples, we could grow potatoes, we could grow, you know, damn near anything you can think of. We could do it here. But it, all of it is going to require less inputs than corn and that they don't want that. Uh, I did a wine tour many years ago in the 80s so that you know it's like 40 years ago and one of the things they said was when you um for the alcohol content half of the uh sugars are turned into alcohol and the other half 
are turned into carbon dioxide. So it would seem as though it would be really hard to use ethanol to uh, reduce climate changing, you know, greenhouse well, gases. Here, you know, the, the thing you have to ask yourself, e even if ethanol is reducing emissions compared to gasoline, even if it does that, what other things could you do on that land mm -hmm. that would have a larger climate benefit? And so like, could you plant oak trees, right? Oak trees are there for four or 500 years, right? And you plant oak trees, you plant oak trees on 10 acres of land over the long haul, you're gonna sequester a lot of carbon. Um, or, you know, restore prairie or, you know, grow potatoes or, you know, whatever you come up with uh, is likely to be better than corn. And so the idea that corn is better than gas gasoline, I mean, it's almost nonsensical to think of it in those terms, but that's where the politics is. That, that's why uh, Biden authorized changing the mix to 15% alcohol, ethanol. Because politically, that's, that's a good thing to do. He's not a dumb politician. Jane? I was wondering about um, the uh, carbon, like using markets, like for car, there's some kind of policies right now about um, carbon trading credits or something. How could that be used to the advantage of what we're talking about here? Yeah, so a big idea now is to pay farmers to sequester carbon. And about carbon know, trading, carbon yeah. trading, yeah. yeah, or trade or, you know, whatever, uh, to, to, um, increase their revenue stream one way or another, get farmers uh, involved in these trading programs that would increase their revenue. And so, you know, the main way we think about that is uh, to, you know, entomb carbon in the soil. And there's ways to do that. Um, reduce tillage is probably the biggest thing uh, that we know, uh, but there's other things too. The problem that we have with those sorts of things is, you know, some farmers have been doing that for a long time. And so what do you do with them? Do you reward them? Um, you know, are you cheating them? If you start paying somebody to start doing it now, you know, how does that work? Um, secondly, a lot of our soils here in Iowa have a lot of carbon in them. And really it's not, uh, slam dunk that you can put any more down there in the soil. So that's another problem. The third thing is it's really hard to quantify it. And by that, I mean to measure it accurately. The fourth thing is when we pay them to do these things, a lot of the carbon is really just sequestered in the top four inches or so of the soil. And so, you know, some spring he might get a hair up his backside and decide he's going to go plow that field. And then, you know, what you've been paying him to do for the last 10 years is gone in one afternoon. And so these practices that they talk about to um, pay farmers to sequester carbon, it's what we say they don't have much permanence, right? The, that carbon is really vulnerable. Now, if we pay them to plant oak trees, you know, that's a different story. You know, those sorts of things that have permanence and have a very definite and quantifiable environmental benefit to the general welfare, you know, I don't have a problem with it. But I think, you know, these uh, soil health ideas uh, and the paying farmers to um, sequester carbon in the soil are really pretty dubious in my estimation. I did have one comment on uh, how do you deal with tenants that have been there and, and done everything. And basically we're waiting for our retirement, uh, our tenant to retire. He's been with us for 43 years or so, a real long time. And he's been 
kind of a close family member in many respects. So uh, we're just going to wait. And, and he's willing to retire anytime if we find someone else. Again, these relationships, right? Relationships are important mm -hmm. to us as, a, as individuals and as a, a culture. And so we, va we put value on these relationships. And so we're reluctant to force the issue. I mean, this is a story you hear over and over and over again. Um, you know, yeah, we know one thing or another should be done, but, you know, this guy's been with us for X number of years and, you know, he's like a brother to me or whatever. And um, I mean, choices, right? I mean, if we want... If we want clean water, we, we're going to have to make some choices here. And um, I mean, that's just the bottom line. That's, that's why I think we need laws. We need laws. <laughs> we have some laws. We, we had to put in uh, a fence because our neighbor has cattle. There are laws that were done in the 19th century, but, but we're still protecting his cattle by maintaining our fence. Sally has a question. Yeah, it's actually a question that, that was in the chat. Um, do you see a point where the system as it is just breaks and sustainable change has to happen? Well, um, you know, the, I think, you know, in Iowa, there's risks here especially associated with wet weather. And so we think a drought as being the big risk and it's really not, it's, it's wet spring weather. And so like this spring, I'm sure you all know, it's their worst nightmare, um, cold and damp and they can't get the seeds in the ground. And this is what they really fear. And so, you know, you can imagine if it turned really wet and stormy in May, which it could do, right? I mean, if you got 10 inches of rain next month, man, there's not much corn going in the ground. Mm -hmm. And so that's a big risk. And so if we had, you know, a climate related uh, catastrophe here with our crop, you know, and maybe a couple of those over a short span, that might drive some change. I think, <clears throat> um, you know, on the drinking water end, it's pretty clear that, you know, that is not going to drive change. I mean, we've polluted the drinking water here just about as badly as we can. And we've polluted it on the individual farms and we've polluted it on the big cities and from northwest to southeast and southwest to northeast. And that has not driven change. And so I don't see that as being a big driver here. What, what does Des Moines do with the nitrogen they remove? So they send it to the wastewater treatment plant. So that used to be a big criticism oh. that they were discharging it back to the river, which they that's, did. That's what they're doing, is discharging it back to the river? river? No, they discharge it to the wastewater treatment plant. Okay, but can the wastewater treatment plant get rid of all the nitrogen? Nope goes into the river oh that so it does they might as well just have a straight pipe right yeah quite, and but. you know they they were discharging it into the river there at fluor drive and you know people in agriculture it was a total red herring you know complained about it all the time well all the nitrate was doing was taking a detour you know mm -hmm. from the river through the treatment plant and back to the river but because they were discharging it back to the river, everybody got upset about that. So they started sending it to the wastewater treatment plant. And now nobody cares. But of course, it still goes back to the river. Ouch. Yeah, you're muted. Go ahead. Do you see the legislation as being in the state or federal that's needed? Oh, I think, you know, I, I think this has got to be at the highest levels, which means federal. Um, you know, Iowa, it's going to be difficult to, you know, handicap Iowa farmers relative to Illinois or Minnesota or what have you. And so 
I think there needs to be some federal action. Now, at the state level, things can happen um, <laughs> and not always very good things. And so like <laughs> we're seeing this, this E15 thing just fly through, right? And like it passed the Iowa Senate, uh, only one guy, only one Democrat voted against it uh, in the whole of the Iowa Senate. And so, um, I don't know, I think I'm really down on the politics here in Iowa. I, I don't see much too. happening here for a long time. And do you see it in the farm bill or separate bills that would be specific to what you're talking about? First thing we have to do is change a subsidy system for commodity crops that incentivizes their production all over the place. And so like crop insurance, the taxpayer pays, you know, at least half of a farmer's crop insurance. Well, that incentivizes perversity all over the place. And we end up planting corn and, and soybeans in places we should never plant them. So like Northeast Iowa, you look at Northeast Iowa, you know, it used to be corn, um, alfalfa, oats mainly, and dairy, and some beef. Uh, now, you know, you got everybody up there uh, wanting to do the same thing as farmers in, you know, Hamilton County or, or uh, Lyon County or whatever. And now there's a terrible nitrate problem in Northeast Iowa, terrible. Um, so they, sh you know, they shouldn't be doing that up there, but, you know, they're going to do it because the farm bill programs are such that we incentivize this perverse behavior. And so, as I said before, we need to define our environmental objectives quantitatively. We need to prioritize them and we need to work backwards in ways that, you know, allows us to achieve that stuff. But agriculture is so recalcitrant towards that idea. I mean, this is just um, conservation 101 is what I'm talking about here. I mean, it's the basics. But agriculture is so recalcitrant to this, they won't even let us have the objectives. <laughs> you know, so what do you do? Uh, you know, I, do, I don't have, people ask me all the time, what are the answers? I don't have them. Okay, Jane has a question. Can you hear me? I'm, yep. Yeah, I guess I'm not muted. I was just wondering, Chris, what your personal history is like. Do you come from a farming background? Do you have farm in your farmland in your family today? No, I mean my grandparents were from the farm, but that's the closest. They my my dad's folks are from. Um, Warren County down near um, Milo and Lacona down there. Um, and then my mom's family, they farmed down uh, near Blakesburg, Iowa, which is uh, Davis County, far Southern Iowa. And my folks both grew up in Knoxville in town. They did not grow up on the farm. Um, and then I grew up in Ankeny. And, you know, my dad's passed away. My mom's still alive. She still lives in Ankeny. Um, but no, I, I never lived on a farm. I don't farm. Okay. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a chemist by training. Um, so. Linda has a question. Yeah. You're muted, Linda. Thank you, Terry. Um, Chris, what's the body that we have that has to acknowledge our environmental objectives? Who has to really uh, sanctify them, I guess, is the word I'll use. <clears throat> or, well, in Iowa, it's got to be the Iowa Farm Bureau, right? <laughs> I think we all know that. Okay. But also DNR and the other governmental ones, they probably are not allowed either in some ways. Is that because so of DNR the had the opportunity about, I think it was 2008 to establish um, 
nutrient standards for lakes. And in fact, I was on the, the technical advisory committee to establish the standards. And so it was a team of scientists. We determined what the nutrient levels in lakes, the maximums should be and presented it to DNR and they shelved it because Farm Bureau objected to it. And the, um, the lakes were supposed to be the warm up for streams. And so once we got the lake standards done, we were gonna do streams. And, and so now, you know, the, and we still don't have standards. And um, Iowa Environmental Council brought suit or petitioned again for standards, I think about two or three years ago, just right before COVID. And the Environmental Protection Commission that oversees DNR denied the petition. And so um, DNR is not supporting uh, standards right now. Uh, Sally asks, uh, what about the EPA? Do they have any any power well, in this? Um, the Iowa legislature, so Iowa DNR has prime, what we call primacy in Iowa. Mm -hmm. And what that means is they have the authority to enforce the regulations associated with the various laws, the Clean Water Act and so forth. And so if a state is not doing an adequate job of that, EPA can come in and take primacy. And EPA has threatened to do that in the past with livestock enforcement. Uh, it's been several years ago, but EPA did threaten to take primacy on that, but they didn't. And so what the legislature, the typical strategy by the legislature is to fund DNR just at a, enough that will keep EPA at bay where they won't want to take primacy. Chris, we've kept you for an hour and a half, and uh, I think everybody's really engaged. I've never seen a, a webinar with our group that, that had more questions and, and engagement. Thank you very much for your, your time and your wisdom. Okay. Appreciate it. Well, sorry if I made anybody mad, but that's what No, I mean. you won't in this crowd. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're mostly environmentalists, so it, it matters to us tremendously. I also just thank you, Chris. I really appreciated the discussion and listening. And and I I get lost in the quagmire of not knowing what to do. But <clears throat> at least we're talking with each other. And I appreciate yeah. that. <clears throat> okay. okay. Well, thanks for the invitation. Real good. And I sent right. you an email for your address. I did. I got it. Okay. Thank you, Chris. All right. Thanks. Uh -huh. good.